Welcome, Heartache Connoisseur listeners. This is your host, Marty Carpenter, coming to you from flyover country today with another episode of the Heartache Connoisseur podcast. So, when I was a youngster, I don't know, five, six years old, and there's this family photo of me floating around somewhere where I'm wearing this donkey costume. I was going to be maybe in the church Sunday school play. I'm guessing I was part of the nativity. <laughs> and uh, I'm there in a, in a little little brown donkey costume with floppy ears that my mom sewed with her very own hands. And uh, I want to pose this way of understanding things to you in terms of the costume. So you can imagine that uh, this is this is a philosophical opinion okay others there are people who disagree with this but my my humble opinion is that there is indeed something different between our fleshly nature if you will or our 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 meat suit that we're all walking around in here versus the the soul the spirit that that thing which animates us that's down deep in us, that electricity, that charge, that it goes beyond just biological processes, that there's something divine placed within us. It's not that the two are completely separate or unrelated, but they're separate enough that they deserve uh, treatment as, as perhaps separate entities when we're discussing them. So you can imagine this life progressing and the first part of your life, let's say, you're, you're, somebody puts you in this costume. You start to learn the rules. I mean, you come out as a baby, right? You don't know anything. You're just all reflexes and instinct and intuition. And you just, your eyes light up and you look around and you crawl here and there and you nurse and you laugh at funny faces and you don't know who's who. And you just, you're not thinking about much. You can't possibly be. A little bit. I'm sure that babies have some, some rudimentary thoughts about things, but mostly it's, it's all hunch and instinct driven. And then mama comes along and puts you in a donkey suit. <laughs> and uh, then the games begin. We begin to learn to take on these characters. It's as if we all put on costumes. And they become ever more elaborate. You know, mom and dad pin things to us and add a little of this and a little of that. And uh, we go to school. We pick up some uh, new feathers for our caps. We, we pick up some new um, tricks and ideals. And, and our costumes become ever more elaborate. And we, we become out of touch with this internal uh, state that we are born with in the form of this soul and that's animating the newborn baby. And after a while, this, this costume gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And then it grows tentacles and it begins to penetrate your skin and grow roots and get deep. And it's hard to even think you can't, it becomes one. You, you can't even imagine taking it off. It just, it's this, it's this monster it takes on a life of its own. And then one day something comes along that is uh, so inconsistent with the nature of the, of the identity you've developed for yourself in the form of this costume that you really, you really have no choice then but to acknowledge that you're wearing one at all. So this donkey suit, let's say, you know, it's, it's getting heavier, it's getting bigger, it's growing real fur. I'm becoming a bigger and bigger ass, if you will. <laughs> and then something comes along. In my case, it was heavily centered around the crisis of my divorce. And through that process, realizing that in my very darkest moments and in the depths of my shame and despair, that I was still loved by God. And being loved by God is fully in spite of all of our shame and wickedness, is completely incompatible with me being this, this giant ass. They don't fit. I mean, I could be that. But now, if I do know that there is, that there is a, a divine 
being that cares about me, that's with me, that's giving me grace and mercy, that's sustaining me throughout my life, no matter what, then that changes things. Then then once that reality occurs and, and, and comes to you, then the only thing that makes any sense at all is to begin the process of peeling off this costume, of simply stepping out. Now, that's scary because we're not sure what's under there anymore. Furthermore, it's shrunk. It's small. It's been suffocated. As the costume gets heavier, we become more and more disassociated with our truest essences. And finding them can be a trek. It's It's an arduous journey. So, I want to talk about what it means to be ordered and what it means to live a life that looks like it's in keeping with the rules but is driven by something much deeper. Because as I listened back to this, I thought, well, you know, a lot of people live very ordered, structured lives that are are totally in keeping with the rules, so to speak. But they're different than the people that have this sort of obsessive compulsive temperament. So what's the difference? And I believe the difference is an internal posture. That which drives the rule keeping itself. I don't want to shame anybody. I certainly don't want to to, uh, elicit any feelings of self-condemnation if you tend to be a rule keeper or a rule follower because it's not a bad thing it has all kinds of benefit for yourself your family and society at large and nobody is one or the other of these two categories is that i'm about to explain and that we're all in transition we're in flux and we might even ping pong back and forth between these two broad categories those categories essentially are what I might call fear-based rule-keeping versus conviction-based rule-keeping or orderliness, okay? Instead of thinking about it in terms of of rule-following exactly, we're going to think about it in terms of orderliness. Maybe you get up at a regimented time. You have your breakfast. You do your devotions, your quiet time, your reading, your exercise, your meditation, your prayer. You check your email, you do your Facebook, you take a walk, whatever it is. You have these rituals and routines. You're not hung over when you wake up. You get to work. You're dutiful. You you, uh, get it done. You're productive. You're, You're a highly effective person, right? Well, I want to draw a distinction between a life of orderliness driven by fear and a life of orderliness driven by a deep conviction. First off, a fear-based life, orderly though it may be, is essentially governed by public opinion and, and brain-centered, what I might say are brain-centered false beliefs as opposed to soul-centered notions. And it tends to be rigid and inflexible. Whereas this conviction-based ordered life, it ignores this. It ignores public opinion in favor of internal promptings, whisperings, compassion for the self and others. And, And there's an actual dialogue and communion with the divine. Contrasted with a frantic attempt to memorize appropriate behavior according to the mores of our social circle or even our church. The fear-based find their safety in knowing these rules and following them. That is, that is where they find comfort. That is how they, they do life in this crazy world is by clinging to these rules. Whereas the conviction-based life is based around an awareness that there is no safety on earth, that there is no such thing. And so even attempting to find and cling to and hold on to safety is a false premise. 
and that the only place there's any safety at all is in actual faith in the eternal promises of the, of the Lord on high. You see the difference? Well, the, the rules-based person is, is doing it. They would say, I'm doing it because it's the right thing. It's what God says to do. But the thing is, is that you take a person like that and you put them in a different environment, and they just morph into whatever environment you put them in. They just they just follow along. They're a limbing. The conviction based person, you put them in a different environment, and they encounter something that's that's counter to the principles that govern their lives, and they're liable to push back in a way that's driven by genuine love. The rules based person is likely to just sort of sit in the back and follow along and go along with the crowd, you know? And what do I mean by this brain is primary? Uh, I mean, it's the, it's the thinker, the, the, the fear-based person thinks and they weigh and they check boxes and they go through lists and they acquire information from books and people and the internet and they assimilate it and they try to form some kind of a systematic way of living. And anything that comes up out of their heart or their soul or the depths of their being, it's seen as a distraction. It's almost seen as an enemy. If it runs counter to their brain-centered ideals. Whereas a convicted person, a person living a life of conviction... Their brain-centered beliefs are secondary. They see their brain as another organ in the human body that's helpful in solving problems, but not the primary seat of that which drives them. Their soul is primary. The worldly opinions are seen as arbitrary. The convicted person sees all of the worldly ways of doing business as made up by people. And that there's no way to follow those systems and find real truth that's lasting. And so the, the fear-based, they live a life that's effortful. It's always, it's always requires all this kind of white-knuckling and brow-furrowing and this, these repeated failed attempts at self-discipline to follow it to the letter. Whereas the convicted-based, they just sort of do it without thinking about it almost because they're they're living in the moment and they're following the promptings of their internal state moment by moment they're they're staying in communion with the divine and that's what's driving them not attempts to understand and live by any rules but don't they read the same bible what happens when they read that bible and they see those rules or or whatever religious text you want to name it doesn't matter they they've all got rules in them if you want to read them that way so what the fear-based person does is they read those rules and then they follow there's no gray it's black and white breaking the rules is bad and keeping the rules is good and it's that simple period one with depth of conviction sees those rules and may realize they're already living in accordance with them <laughs> but it's not because that they're directly attempting to follow follow them exactly, but they're engaging in a life of pursuit of depth with the divine, depth of communion, and that as a natural outcropping of that pursuit, they begin to live ordered lives that are in keeping with many of what could be considered the rules. And so instead of seeing rule-breaking as bad and keeping rules as good, the mature and convicted see anything that distances oneself from communion with the divine as bad and anything that cultivates a relationship with the divine as good. You see that difference? That's, that's what makes a rule good or bad, not what everybody else believes or what the book says, but whether or not that particular precept brings me closer to God. 
The fear base still reap the benefits of avoiding the destructive behaviors and engaging in healthy behaviors, but these benefits are offset by this loss of sense of internal freedom and autonomy. It's like living in prison. I mean, that's a perfect uh, analogy or metaphor is that, you know, you're, you've created walls for yourself and bars and you stay within those. Yes, you don't get, you know, liver disease from being an alcoholic or sexually transmitted diseases. And maybe you have a good, uh, healthy retirement account because you've saved your money diligently and uh, people you know, basically like you because you show up and help and work hard. Uh, but they probably don't look to you for any real guidance. Now, the the convicted, they reap the benefits of, of healthy engagement and avoidance of, of painful and destructive behaviors. But over time, they tend to increase in their softness and they increase in their flexibility. And their interpersonal relationships, they tend to, to deepen and they become mentors to others and they're seen as leaders and they have compassion on others. And people who live from a fear base, they, they're seen as um, oftentimes crotchety, stuffy, rigid, inflexible. They rain on people's parade. They're uh, Dudley Do-Rights. They... they uh, they sacrifice the spirit of the law for the letter of the law. You know, the Sabbath uh, passage where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and they say, what are you doing healing people on the Sabbath? <laughs> You're working, aren't you? And he's like, look, I don't serve the Sabbath. The Sabbath serves me. Right? Isn't that an amazing way of saying it? Like the, the Sabbath is this gift to me whereby I rest. Because it's it's helpful to me. But but if this person's before me in need of healing and I move by compassion, you're you're darn right I'm gonna do something about it. And what about things that stretch us? Because I mean, this is an important point about growing up is that we face activities throughout the course of our life that really stretch us and they cause us to to think differently about things. And I think that people who operate from a more fear-based perspective tend to see those types of things as threatening and to be avoided. Things outside of the box, outside of the comfort zone, whereas those driven by a sense of deep conviction, they see those as opportunities to grow and to go even deeper in their pursuit of knowledge of one's own self and, and of God. While they still experience the pain of being stretched, they consider this dying to the self. Whereas a fear-based person will see the pain as something to be avoided and they're unaware that every time they avoid the internal tensions and just revert to their black and white rule-following stance that they are not in fact dying to themselves but they are puffing up their own ego. So this is a a book that my wife happens to be reading right now. It's called Living Beautifully by Pima Chodron. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And here's a passage from this book. She says, It's not enough, however, just to follow the rules, follow the precepts to the letter. Sticking to the outer form can be just another way of strengthening my fixed identity a way of shoring up my self-image as a virtuous person, as someone who, who's purer than others. In other words, it may only strengthen pride. You see, it's back to this costume. It's, it's the costume is the rule follower. And when I follow them, it's just hanging more ornaments and trinkets onto this costume and making it heavier and heavier as opposed to letting the costume fall away and finding that internal sense of spirit and allowing it to grow and burst forth. I got some feedback from a listener and uh, I wanted to read it here. This is, um, this is good. And it's about the last episode that was titled Sweatin' Like a Shrinkin' Church. It says, We listened this morning. I was really interested to see the problems 
related to the neurotic types. I saw myself in some of the analysis, but feel I was able to break through with my own focus and outside studying. A big dose of real presence of God would bring many out of their comfortable stupor. I am a rule keeper most of the time, and that makes me uncomfortable in messy church. But that is where the real action is. Our pastor gave a sermon this week about our not reaching those who feel outcast. And we had a local couple in our church who are known local drug users. I was pleased to see the warm welcome and hugs that they got as we were leaving. Love is the answer to all. This is a person who is aware of what I'm talking about. This is a person who is in touch with their own fear. They're able to name it. They're able to push through it and love the outcast. Even though that person may be dirty and a rule breaker and threaten me harm and cavorting with them could threaten my reputation. But that's what we're called to do. We're we're called to lean into our own confusion and pain and uncertainty. And we're we're called to abandon the black and the white and embrace the fact that this is a messy place down here on earth. That there is no way to fashion an existence that protects us forever from the challenges that earth brings to us. Life is a journey of letting go of the black and the white and embracing the mess and that that's where the freedom is it's don't stand on the side while everybody else is down there playing in the lake you know but the water's dirty and i can't see to the bottom but they're having a great time i don't know i might step in the bottom where it's muddy and it's gross yeah i know but they're having a great time Yeah, but, you know, there's probably fish in there and they might nip at my toes. Yeah, but, man, they're having a great time. That's what I mean. I mean, you got to just get in there, whatever it is, where your convictions lead you, follow. Even if it doesn't make sense. Even if you can't see the outcome immediately in front of you. Even if if it seems foolish. To your rule-following friends and family. Follow your convictions. Do the thing that takes you outside of your comfort zone. There you will find richness and depth and life and meaning and purpose and communion with the divine.